Here we are at the entryway to Dakota Modern, the art of Oscar Howe at the South Dakota Art Museum. Hi, my name is Abigail Ramsbottom and I'm the Curator of Education. I'll be giving a virtual tour of Dakota Modern, the art of Oscar Howe, as well as continuum honoring Oscar Howe's legacy, which have been on display at the Art Museum from June 10th, 2023 to September 17th, 2023. Dakota Modern was a traveling exhibition it first was exhibited at the National Museum of the American Indian in Manhattan. It then moved to the Portland Art Museum in Oregon, and its final destination is here in Brookings, South Dakota, uh, the state where Oscar Howe was born and lived most of his life. Now, this exhibition was curated by curator Kathleen Ash Milby, who currently works at the Portland Art Museum, but they were many folks who made this exhibition possible. I want to give big thanks to the National Museum of the American Indian, a Smithsonian institution, the Portland Art Museum, the Henry Luce Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, and those who made Dakota Modern happen here at the South Dakota Art Museum. Thank you to First Bank and Trust, a generous anonymous supporter, South Dakota State University's Office of the President, and South Dakota State University's Wakini Initiative. Thanks to Venance and Deborah Landkeek. Thanks to Meyer Orthodontics. And thank you to the Fantle Endowment Fund, Bill and Rita Larson Endowment for Education, Carol and Alan Bender Endowment, Dorothy and Jim Morgan, Craig and Della Cheddar, The Event Company, Ruth and Eric Brown, Marsha and David Sheequin, Ruth Harper and Larry Rogers, Thomas and Sharon Haskell, Carol and Alan Johnson, Rick and Rhea McEwen, Donna and Frank Merck, Lisa Skolton, the SDSU Alumni Center and SDSU Foundation, Harriet Swedland, TNR Service Company, Sharon and Gary Van Riper, Bonnie A. Levin in memory, in memory of Elsie Luth Levin, Jean and Tom Manzer in honor of Lenico Lee. And of course, as always, significant operational support for the South Dakota Art Museum is provided by South Dakota State University. Additional support is provided by the South Dakota Arts Council, and museum members and donors. Thank you everyone for your great support. Oscar Howe was Yankton-I, Dakota. He was born in 1915 at Joe Creek on the Crow Creek Reservation, which is in between Chamberlain and Pier along the Missouri River. And for much of Oscar Howe's life, he lived along the Missouri River of South Dakota. His, those exceptions are he served in World War II. He also left the state to study art, both at the Santa Fe Indian School as well as the University of Oklahoma. Now, Oscar Howe proved that he was simultaneously embedded in modern art and customary Ochetti Shakowin aesthetics. Here on this wall, we see his early style. And on the other wall, the opposite wall, we can see his mature, abstract style. In his 40-year career, he was committed to the preservation, relevance, celebration, and understanding of Ochetti Shakowin cultures. Now, even as a young child, Oscar Howe was an artist. He says in his oral history that he was fascinated by lines, that he would take his pencils and draw just lines, not figures or forms, but marks, so much so that his parents took his pencils away. And what he did after that was he grabbed charcoal from the stove, and I have a quote from Howe here, which was even more exciting because the smudge added the lines formed, forms and masses. I saw designs, abstractions of another dimension. I was happy making these designs. We're going to see the importance of line not only early on in Oscar Howe's work, but continued during his whole career. Now, as an artist, Oscar Howe was one of many artists who got their start in government-run schools. At the age of seven, Oscar Howe was sent to a boarding school in Pier, now the Pier Indian Learning Center. At seven years old, he went with his older brothers and he spoke no English. So his knowledge was that of the Dakota language, and he was part of those assimilation practices of that time. Fast forward a few years later, he went to the Santa Fe Indian School, which had a newly established studio art program run by Dorothy Dunn. No relation to Harvey Dunn for the South Dakota art history fans. 
And what the studio style aimed to do was to train contemporary Native artists of that time in a very particular style that was influenced by Pueblo pottery design as well as Plains ledger art. Now, what are the characteristics of that studio style? Well, there's a couple things that I can point out to you here. Firstly, we notice a lack of background, right? So we do not see representation of the space where these figures are, uh, are inhabited. There's no paint on the paper. It's completely blank. Another characteristic is the lack of shading or these flat fields of color. So we don't see, you know, those hue changes or tonal shifts in the colors. It's rather um, these blocks of ver variety of colors. And those colors are earth tones. So there's not an intent to showcase a lot of vibrant colors, which is kind of different from what we just saw in his mature style. And finally, um, there's also a lack of 3D modeling or the attempt to showcase depth in the space, right? So these are flat figures. And you'll see the same thing here on blue antelope, which is a gouache on Bristol board piece. So we have this antelope who's rendered flat. And I'm gonna ask you to take a mental picture of this antelope because the exhibition ends in the section called animal lyricism. And what we see there is a major shift and it gives us a good idea of the evolution of Oscar Howe's artistic style. So what we notice here are these thin lines. So thinking about Oscar Howe's interest in line, it appears that the antelope's in water, we have this gradient dark blue to white. And then we have a very minimal background, right? So just kind of some ridges here. And this could be um, a stylized representation of a hill or a mountain. Um, but it's a relatively flat and um, still image. There's not a lot of motion going on. So we're gonna keep moving to the next section of the exhibition. Now, these works on this wall are from Oscar Howe's time um, with his Master's in Fine Arts program in the University of Oklahoma. But we're going to jump past that to take a look at this work. This piece is called Dakota Duck Hunt. It's from around 1945 and it's a watercolor on paper. I do like to point out the water in the background, as we see very similar to that studio style, that water that he was just, um, that he was working on in the blue antelope. Now, why is this piece special? Well, it's more so to do with the story behind it than the content of the image in this case. Oscar Howe, um, in the 1940s, for the first time participated in a national visible competition for contemporary Native artists called the Philbrook Indian Annual. It was put on by the Philbrook Art Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it, uh, that museum is now called the Philbrook Art Museum. So this competition, Oscar Howe submitted this as his very first work, and he won the Grand Purchase Prize, which was an incredible achievement for a young artist, 1940s. So we're talking about a 30-year-old Oscar Howe, um, and he's received national recognition for the art that he's making. Fast forward a decade, and Oscar Howe submits this work, Yemeni Wachipi, to the same competition. Now, within those 10 years, Oscar Howe was a juror and a longtime participant of this competition. So not only was he participating as an artist, but he was also judging and awarding other artists. So, Yamini Wachipi, which translates to War and Peace Dance, was submitted to this competition. And the curators reviewed it and rejected this piece from exhibition. They said to him, it was a fine painting, but it was not Indian. Now, Oscar Howe took great offense to this claim, and he fired back with an impassioned letter, which we see here as well. And I'll just read the first few sentences. He says to the curators, whoever said that my paintings are not in the traditional Indian style has poor knowledge of Indian art indeed. There is much more to Indian art than pretty stylized pictures. There was also power and strength and individualism in the old Indian paintings power, strength, and individualism. So Oscar Howe was rooted in his belief that he was practicing those traditional Dakota aesthetic approaches. <laughs> 
And this letter did have some marginal success for him. So the Philbrook Arts Center responded by opening up a few more categories. I believe one of those categories was called non-traditional art to accept works that were more akin to this piece. So we only have a reproduction here because um, this piece is now missing. So if you're in a thrift store and you're trying to, um, you know, find something of value, please take a look for this work. It was purchased by a private collector named Ann Forbes, and Ann Forbes then, then donated it to a nonprofit, and that's where the Provenance Trail ends. So we're not sure if this work even exists anymore, um, but that's why we have this reproduction. So this work, Yumini Dance, is not meant to serve as a stand-in, um, but rather depict something similar. So it's semi-representational, right? We have figures in a space, um, and we do see some similarities, right? This big ovular shape that we just saw in the last one, perhaps to represent a teepee. And then these rhythmic, um, lighter colored lines, which could represent the rhythmic drumming or to create the, the feeling of sound in a visual artwork. We're going to keep moving to the next section of the exhibition. This exhibition is a selection of public and private collections from across the nation. And the South Dakota Art Museum is very excited to be showing three of their works within this exhibition. Dakota Medicine Man, a 1968 casing on paper piece, is one of the works from our collection. So what I'll say about this work is that we see a medicine man here who is reaching out to find information from the turtle, which could represent wisdom or have some sort of prophetic resonance. We see the smoke and his interest in line with that smoke, right, moving about the canvas. We also see a major shift from Oscar Howe's studio style, right? So I mentioned in that studio style of art, there's no background. Well, here we have a completely full painting, right? There's no space left blank. And as Howe transitioned into this style, he, he talks about um, his interest in negative space. And this is what Howe says, quote, I work the negative areas or the background in non-object design and then allow lines to bring out the positive areas, the foreground, the figure, or the focus. In other words, the negative lines present and suggest the positive ones. It is my belief that the negative areas or background areas or patterns should be as beautiful, if not more beautiful, uh, than the positive or foreground areas or patterns. So as we think about how as an artist and his technique, we have to remember that he was very interested almost more interested in what was going on around the edges, around the background, that would amplify the messages or the imagery that he was trying to impart. And with that, I'll mention that this section is called the storyteller. And this is a large section. So much of the exhibition uh, discovers or um, displays Oscar Howe as a storyteller. Now I mentioned to you that at seven years old, Howe went away to boarding school. Three years later, when Oscar Howe was 10 years old, his mother passed away. This was very difficult for Howe. He ultimately became quite ill himself, um, and he was taken out of boarding school and sent back home to his grandmother at Crow Creek. His grandmother's name was Shellface, and this ended up being a very important moment in time for him. And I'm going to point you to a quote that Howe said about his grandmother. My grandmother would tell these stories, true ones, about culture and life and everything that was fine and good about the Dakota culture. In her native formal tongue, she told about the beautiful and wonderful ceremonial events. I still remember them so clearly. The language she used was so poetic and beautiful in song and in words that I now try to equal them by giving them visual forms. Oscar Howe, 1977. So, Howe learned all of these stories that he wanted to depict from his grandmother. And he wanted to depict them in a way that would equal the beauty that she, um, the language that she shared with him. 
So when we think about Howe's work, we now know that there was always a narrative quality to them. We saw early on that his works became quite abstract, but they continued to have narrative resonance. We're going to keep on moving to the next section of the exhibition, which is called Cultural Figures. So Oscar Howe, as a storyteller, wanted to depict the cultural figures um, from the Dakota culture, largely from Ocheti Shakowin cultures, um, but also he was an active Episcopalian. So we'll also see some, some Christianity uh, or Christian iconography in this exhibition as well. I wanted to point to this piece, which is called Skin Painter. We see a hide painter at work. Visually, we see a similarity to Dakota Medicine Man, right? So this circular imagery with some jagged line work, some energetic line work. And thinking about that quote that I just shared, that he's very conscientious of what's going on in the negative space to encourage the viewer's understanding of this positive space. On this next wall, we take a look at a work called Calling on Wakantanka. This is a casein on paper piece uh, from 1962. And if you're not familiar with casein, um, it's, it's a derivative of a milk protein. And what it is, is a water-based paint. It's quick drying like watercolor, but it gives that, um, that brightness or opacity that we see from oil painting. So it ended up being Howe's predominant paint medium. And I think that has a lot to do for um, the quality of color and that fact that it was quick drying. So in this work, Calling on Wakantanka, we see a family of three who is, as Hal quoted saying, um, appealing to the great spirit to stop a destructive storm that has left wildfires in its wake. Right, so this, these oranges, yellows, and reds, we see that wildfire surrounding the family. The mother, who is seated here, is performing a smoke prayer. And we see that smoke going up all the way, reaching up into the clouds, and even onto the right side, going up, making that movement up into the clouds. The father, who is seen standed here, is at the end of a prayer, offering the pipe. And then in reaction to that, we see this burst of light, and it's an almost rainbow color. We see reds, oranges, blues, greens. Um, and this is intended to show that subtle or or hopeful narrative that the storm might be breaking through. So that flash of light that's breaking through the clouds, um, hopefully the end of this destructive storm. Now I just mentioned to you that Howe was an Episcopalian. So Howe had the duality of uh, adopting Dakota spiritual belief as well as Christian belief. For how the duality of the Christian doctrine as well as Dakota spiritual belief was not an issue. He saw that both could be true. And what we see here is Indian Christ. It's a 1972 casein on paper. He designed this for the apse of the church that he attended in Vermilion. It was called St. Paul's Episcopal. Now, while Tao was alive, this did not get painted onto the apse of the church. But in 2007, University of South Dakota students got together and they painted a replica of this onto the apse of St. Paul's. So if you find yourself in Vermilion and you're looking to go to church, perhaps check out this one um, to see this beautiful work in, in the form that Howe intended it to be in. This was also done, uh, a rendition of this piece was done by South Dakota weaver Greta Bodegard, who in the 1970s was commissioned to do a 7 by 10 foot tapestry of this work, and that piece now hangs in Chamberlain. We can keep on moving to the next part of the exhibition. Now, it was not common for Oscar Howe to depict true historical moments, especially when they had the lens of critique or commenting on racism. But there are exceptions to that, and this piece is one of them. This work is called Fleeing a Massacre, and it's one of the few pieces that we know was done of his grandmother's shell face. In it, we see that a young girl cries out while riding a bloodied horse whose eyes are wide, the nostrils are flared, the mouth is open, and the muscles are tensed. 
from stress and fatigue. We also note their hair, the mane on the horses standing straight up, similarly to the hair on the girl riding. This piece, as I mentioned, was inspired by Oscar Howe's grandmother, Shellface. And this is a quote from Howe. Howe said her, she herself had been in attacks by the whites. She had a scar on her hand where she had been shot through the hand by white soldiers. Howe also said, the massacre occurred somewhere in Minnesota. Her brother put her on this white horse and told her to keep riding. So it's possible that Howe's family descended from the survivors of the 1860s forced relocation of the Dakota people from Minnesota to Crow Creek, South Dakota, following the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862 in the New Ulm area of Minnesota. Howe also said about this piece that as Shellface was writing, she had the American flag on her mind. So we see that here. We see the eye line go directly to this distorted American flag. Thinking about what Howe is doing in the negative space, we don't typically see the black paint as the background. So that can really set the mood of an image, that this is an image of um, grief, something that might be even horrific. We see this skeletal, um, a nod to some sort of skeletal imagery here that's surrounding the image, right? And so as Shellface fleed this massacre, a lot of this grief and this, this energy, even the sounds, perhaps, are represented here following her as she fled. Another notable exception to Howe's um, tendency to not showcase historical imagery is his work on the Wounded Knee Massacre. Now, we only have a reproduction here because this piece is from President Eisenhower's library in Abilene, Kansas. Now, how did President Eisenhower get this work? When Howe was a uh, mature or a more um, prominent artist, he was invited to a TV show called This Is Your Life. So he came on and he just sort of talked about his life and his work as an artist. And after that episode, the television show wanted to purchase a piece. His wife, Heidi, said that they should purchase this one. And after they purchased this piece, they, pres they presented it as a gift to President Eisenhower. It's currently on display at the Presidential Library, so that's why we weren't able to get it for this exhibition. But we do have this graphic reproduction here. Howe claimed that this was not meant to be a shocker, but merely a recorded true event. We see the U.S. Calvary depicted as a monolithic killing machine in stark contrast to the Lakota men, women, and children who were massacred on December 29, 1890 at Wounded Knee Creek. And I'll just point out that how, um, how even was meticulous in this work because we see a planning sketch here to the left, right? So we see that even as... Um, as an artist, he was always thinking about that background, right? The foreground um, and what he would do. So he wasn't someone who would just put paint on paper. He was a planner. He had many sketches um, and he even would do paper folds to think about as different aesthetic points. And I have a quote here from Arthur Amiot, who is a contemporary artist and a student of Oscar Howe. And, um, Basically, this folded draft might give us an idea of Oscar Howe's technique. Arthur Amiot said, Howe then demonstrated the golden mean principle by folding the same size piece of paper into thirds, both horizontally and vertically, and then unfolded it. Where those creases transected each other, he made marks and explained that these four or one points should be where we should locate the part of the drawing we wanted the viewer to see first and from which the other parts of the figure would flow. Now, this is not an example of the golden mean principle, right? So the golden mean principle would have showcased nine rectangles, and there would have been four points that you could have seen quite clearly. So it's not, it's not definitive whether this was an attempt for him to do some sort of um, work on, you know, how the viewer's eye would move about the canvas. Perhaps he was just thinking, I need to take this home with me and work on it, right? So maybe he just folded it up and put it into his briefcase. So this is very speculative, but it does give us an idea of the, the meticulousness or the thoughtfulness that Oscar Howe had for all of his works. <laughs> 
Now we'll move on to the next section, which is Oscar Howe's Public Works section. Oscar Howe was trained as a mural painter alongside other Native artists in the Work Projects Administration. The WPA gave him his first commission in 1940, and it was of this um, building, the Carnegie Library in Mitchell, South Dakota. He was commissioned to paint the dome, and here we see a picture of that dome, right? So it's the sun and rain clouds over the hills. We also see a planning um, design for it. And I'll just point out those different details, right? So we see that sun here, the light coming in on the dome, and then the rain clouds, those blue clouds, the stylized dots of rain, and then the lightning bolts over the hills. And what we see here is a, a similar image to what we might have seen in that early studio style. So this is 1940, just five years after his time at the Santa Fe Indian School. And that those stylized hills are similar to what we saw with that blue antelope, if you recall that. So his work is still kind of in that early style in 1940, but even as he continued with his public works projects, we see a shift. He received a second WPA commission in 1942, so just two years later, to do the Mowbridge murals at the Mowbridge Auditorium. My understanding is that these were recently conserved, so you can go and see them even today. He designed a set of 10 murals, and here we see a depiction of the South Wall, which Howe entitled Ceremonies of the Sioux. He also had a selection of works along the North Wall, and these are two examples from the North Wall. He entitled those, um, that section History Along the Missouri. Now, stylistically, we see that this is a little bit unique. It does not look much like the studio style. It also does not look much like his later style. I like to share with people that while Howe was working on these murals, he was called to serve in World War II. He was given a two-week extension to stay in the States and complete this project. So you can imagine that he might have felt rushed, or perhaps he was preoccupied with the fact that he was about to head to war. So I just like to make that note as we think about why they look a little bit different than some other works that we've seen by him. Now, Oscar Howe's um, grand opus of his public work projects was his time at the Mitchell Corn Palace. Oscar Howe was very excited about this opportunity. He said, uh, now I shall have my big chance. That's a quote from Howe. And he acknowledged that it was not viewed as an art achievement, but he was so ready to have that public visibility and to connect with everyday people. So what Howe would do, and I'll invite you to come closer and look, what Howe would do is he would make these maquettes. He would do designs for the facade of the Corn Palace and annotate what color corn to use. So we see dark red, light red, red, and white. So he had the opportunity to use four colors of corn, and he would instruct the installers in this way. We also can see this grid pattern around his works. And what that grid pattern was for was to showcase how to enlarge and keep the, keep the imagery to proportion. So we have a vinyl photograph to the left, and that can give us a sense of how that worked. So how here is demonstrating, perhaps for installers, um, how to create this imagery onto the facade of the Corn Palace. So that grid would be enlarged and replicated onto the facade, and then you could expand his imagery to, to showcase the same design that Howe himself had created. Howe designed the Corn Palace from 1948 to 1971. So he had a 23-year career as the designer of the Corn Palace, and he felt that it was an opportunity for him to showcase the potential for unity between Native and non-Native peoples. I like to point out that he didn't, he did um, content that was um, in some ways everyday content for those tourists that would be visiting the, the Corn Palace. We see the representation of a business person, perhaps a priest. And I think that these two are a great example of showcasing that potential for unity. So people, uh, all people can come together um, with certain ideas, and one of those things that we can come together on is dance. So here we see three male dancers, and below we see the example of a barn dance. 
So how had this opportunity to to depict, you know, quotidian or everyday commonalities between all peoples. And he, he took that opportunity at the Corn Palace. So we'll keep moving on to the next section of the exhibition. Oh, I forgot to take this cover off. So you get a bit of a sneak peek. Um, part of the Stipulations of this exhibition are that some works have to be completely covered when we are closed. And what that, the reason for that is because a lot of these works are works on paper, and that means that they're quite light sensitive. So some of those works that are particularly light sensitive have to be covered from any light coming in while we're closed. So it's thinking about museum best practices and the safety of house artwork. Now this room is a really lovely room for a couple reasons. In this space, we get to see Howe's practice in high school all the way up to his mature style in the 60s, right? So when he's in his, his 50s. Now another reason why this room is special is because of the subject matter. So Howe returned to certain subjects that he found particularly interesting, whether for their representational potentials or because of the cultural references or the importance that he saw in those. So one of those subjects in particular uh, was that of the sun dance, particularly the moment when the dancers break free from the poles in a moment of transcendence. Now I like to contextualize this by noting that during parts of Howe's lifetime, the sun dance was made to be illegal. So thinking about how as someone who was really trying to preserve, um, make relevant, celebrate, and understand Ocedi Shakowin cultures, um, we can think about how certain things he might have documented with that mindset of making sure that things remained visible even when they were attempted to be silenced. Now in this high school rendition of this subject matter, we see that we're kind of far away as a viewer. The dancers are in those flat fields of color, right? That's something that I mentioned from that studio style. The background is a little bit sparse, and then we have these blank spaces where there's no paint whatsoever. Even moving forward, we're becoming a little bit closer to the scene. We have a representational background, still somewhat stylized in that studio style. We see some teepees in the background but it's still relatively a conventional space. Continuing to move forward, perspective has shifted greatly. So now we're moving even closer until we get to that 1965 work of the Sundance where that the viewer sees directly beneath looking up at the pole, we see the dancers in a swirl of ecstasy and that sun is just pulsating with the reds, oranges and yellows all around. Right, in those dancers, we see the hair moving all the way even in this section as well. So we get to see this moment of transcendence and how, as a mature artist, we can also see how successful he became in, in his desire to partic depict particular uh, imagery. So I always like to say in this section, if you're in high school and you're not super happy with where your art is right now, just think about in three decades where your art could be. So we'll keep on moving to the next section. And, and as we move toward the end of this tour, we begin to see Howe's work take a geometric and abstract shift. So much so that some of his works appear to be completely abstract. Now I say appear because Howe maintained uh, his uh, narrative qualities in his work. So he was always a narrative painter. And we look at this work and we see a riot of fractured reds and yellows and many geometric shapes. And what helps us know what's actually going on is the title that Howe has left us, Cording. It's a 1970 case seen on paper. And Cording um, speaks to traditional planes custom that where um, a man could visit a woman underneath the privacy of a blanket. So acceptable courting practice. And now looking at it with that knowledge and the title courting, we might be able to see that this blanket does hold two figures, right? So that left and that right. And perhaps we're seeing the sun or the light in that um, negative space that Howe was so interested in. <laughs> 
Now, there's a quote on this wall, and um, it's from Oscar Howe in 1981. He says, I have been labeled wrongfully a cubist. Now, as his space became more fractured, um, people thought that Howe was practicing cubism. And there was a very pervasive narrative in the arts community that Oscar Howe went to Germany in World War II, and that's where he was exposed to modern art, where he saw artists um, work like Pablo Picasso or George Brox, who's a well-known analytic cubist. Now, how, we know that's not true for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that Howe went to art school. So even though he wasn't living in Europe, he was aware of the art movements that were going on. Secondly, Howe maintained that he was practicing um, the traditional Dakota aesthetic approaches that his artistic forebearers practiced, and that was called tohokmu. Now, it's sometimes called the spiderweb design, but it's not a one-to-one -one translation. It has, um, it's connected to a story about a boy's vision of a spiderweb. But what it was and what Oscar Howe taught to his students. We heard from Donald Montalo and Brian Akipa a story about how Howe taught um, this Tohokmu method. So we would have students look at a blank sheet of paper and then let points emerge and then mark those points and connect them with line. I can equate this by thinking about if you look up at a light and then close your eyes, you might still be seeing that light. So thinking about letting those aesthetic points emerge, and we actually have an example of Howe's process on this wall over here. So this is Howe's process wall in the exhibition. And here we see an example of Howe practicing the spider web design. You might have even seen a little bit of this design in some of Howe's backgrounds or even in some of his works. So we see aesthetic points emerging and all of the lines that Howe would use to connect them. So remember I said right at the beginning of the tour, Howe had this childhood fascination with line that would continue on forever. And we see that in this, this style, in this aesthetic approach that he used, we also see his meticulousness, his focus on those planning sketches um, and everything that came before a final painting. Now, I'll just point you to a couple of the pieces over here. So, um, yes, there is a visual similarity to analytic cubism, but the process getting there was much different than what those European modernists were doing. Here we see Dancers, a 1969 work, and we do see that instead of that three-dimensional modeling, we're almost back to that studio style where there's just flat um, figures on a canvas. But now those figures, those dancers, have become so abstract that they're on one single plane of geometric shapes of varying colors. I want to also point out the texture. Maybe you've noticed this in other works that you've seen of Howe's. There's a lot of texture going on in the paper. Now what Howe would do is he would soak his paper and then he would stretch it. So he would do this practice and when it would dry, it would create these wonderful ripples that added a lot of dimension to his work. So that was one of his techniques. Now we're going to move on to animal lyricism. I told you to remember that blue antelope from the beginning because you can see the culmination of his animal representation in this final section. And I'll read one of these final quotes from Howe. Art is altruistic and exists independently. Something for intellect and emotions, art is never without meaning. Oscar Howe turned to animals for inspiration many times. Sometimes it was cultural referencing, other times they were standalone subjects. And in Deer Dance in particular, we see the culmination of all his different practices. Thinking back to his childhood time, we see his use of line really prominently in the representation of the flora in this image. So we see all of these delicate lines moving throughout the canvas. We also see a nod to the studio style. Although it's quite a departure from the studio style, we do see these flat fields of color 
that's representing the rocky landscape that the deer are dancing or moving about on. Thinking about how, as someone who's very conscientious of the negative space, we see beautiful blues, greens, browns in this um, background that amplify or nod to the creatures in the foreground, right? And we even see some of those color connections. We have this deer with some grasses in its mouth, but we are quite departed from the studio style in the sense of that blue antelope who was flat and who was in this profile view. Now we have all sides of the deer depicted. We see the back, the side, the front, and we also see that they are in motion. This is a dynamic image. And we see many different colors and shading to give that um, three-dimensional modeling to these deer. And similarly, we can see um, Howe's culminating style in fighting bucks. So we see this wonderful tangling of antlers. We see the eye of one of the bucks bright and wide, and then this flurry of energy surrounding them. So this, can, this negative space, again, lends itself to that really intense energy and movement that's going on with um, what we might have seen before, fighting bucks in the forest. And finally, I'll take you to horses. This is another work from the South Dakota Art Museum. So thinking about dynamism and movement, we have this circle, circular motion of the horses, right? And we look at their, um, their faces as they move. So they're pointing our eye to kind of take a clockwise circle. But we also have this really frantic energy of the manes, right? So it's almost like how was scratching back and forth with his, with his paintbrush. But we see this really lovely and intense movement of the manes, giving us an idea of like, just how much these horses are moving about the space. We don't know what landscape they're in, right? So there's not much of a representational background, but we do get the sense that these horses are taking a very quick movement. Now the last piece of this exhibition is this work here. It's entitled, He Came From Fire, and it's a 1965 work. And I'll point you to the quote next to it. This is our art. And here is where we are making our last stand. The least we can do is fight this battle that Indian culture may live forever. Oscar Howe truly catalyzed a movement um, for native artists to have their own artistic individuality and to do work um, that wasn't assigned by a school or by outside, um, outside institutions. Now, Oscar Howe's legacy can be seen today in the Native American artists who are practicing abstraction or um, figurative work as well. Howe was a teacher to many, and those students are represented in our next exhibition, Continuum Honoring Oscar Howe's Legacy. Oscar Howe proved that you could be simultaneously modern while embedded in traditional Ocheti Shakowin aesthetics. Um, and he had great success breaking the mold and doing something different. He was an activist, right? So either in his letters or in his promotion of um, his rights as an artist to depict what he saw fit, um, as well as an incredibly accomplished painter. So thank you so much for taking this tour with me today. And I invite you to come into the next section with me, Continuum Honoring Oscar Howe's Legacy. All right, so after you walk through the Dakota Modern Exhibition, you're brought to the next gallery, which is called Continuum Honoring Oscar Howe's Legacy. Now, we formed a committee of trusted advisors and asked the question, what would you like to see and experience alongside the Dakota Modern Exhibition? The notion of Oscar Howe's legacy became the centerpiece of those conversations. So in this way, we invited a selection of Oscar Howe's students to select pieces where they felt that Oscar Howe's legacy was shown while showcasing their own artistic and creative talents. Continuing this notion of continuum, um, we had those students select their protégés. So in this way, we have many generations of Native artists feature who are in some way touched by the ripples of Oscar Howe's legacy.
We also have a selection of uh, a sample of Howe's further reach, what we call those who may not have studied directly with one of Howe's students or with Howe himself, but have noted Oscar Howe as points of inspiration in their creative process. So if you take a moment to look at some of these pieces, um, you'll be able to see Oscar Howe's continued impact, both in the state of South Dakota, but even beyond, from artists who are living in Canada, Colorado, and everywhere in between.